Those were the days before we took the musicians with us and all of that. And it was Saturday night. The crowds had been excellent all week long. And this Saturday night was the close of the meeting and the building, if I remember correctly, was just about filled. I preached on the subject, more abundant life. And thank God Jesus Christ still gives more abundant life. Hallelujah. I mean more abundant life, not just abundant life, but more abundant life. And God moved, and when I gave the altar call, people began to come. And I don't know, 10, 15 minutes into the altar call, if that, out of my corner of my eye, I saw a man dragging his right leg, and he came up on the platform and um, walked toward me, still dragging that leg. I didn't know who he was. I'd never seen him before. And he stood there before me and he said, Brother Swagger, he said, I was to go tonight to the Republic of Panama, Panama City, and said, one year ago today, a man in that city shot me and made me a cripple for life. And said, I was going to kill him. I'd made up my mind. But my mother, he said, kept asking me, son, when I asked her, what do you want for your birthday? For that day was also her birthday. And she said, I want you to go to church with me tonight. He said, Mama, I don't want to do that. And he said, I just don't want to do it. She said, but that's my birthday present, if you want to please me. Finally, he said, okay, and came. And he said, Brother Swagger, and he reached in his coat pocket and pulled out the longest revolver. <laughs> I mean, I thought that sermon hope wasn't that bad. <laughs> and he held that long barrel 38 up right in front of my face. He said, I'm going to go to Panama City when I leave here tonight, but I'm not going to kill that man. I'm going, I know where he works and I'm going to find him, but I'm going to tell him, you have nothing to fear from me, for Jesus Christ has come into my heart and come into my life. And he said, here, this gun is yours. <laughs> and uh, I thought, Lord, thank you. You saved two lives tonight. <laughs> and only Jesus Christ can satisfy a broken heart. Yeah. Only Jesus can set the captive free. Yeah. Only Jesus can give more abundant life. Bethlehem, one of the most renowned little cities in the world. Some time back we were there and we were at what was said to be uh, the field of Boaz. Some 17, some 2700 years ago is the setting of this little message tonight. And there were some photographers there and, and um, several people of that stripe. And they said, what did you come here for? What was your reason for coming? I said, well, it's very interesting to me as to Boaz's field. But the story of Ruth, for she gleaned in this field, is to me one of the most remarkable in the world. And as I began this 
illustration. It does not, well, let me put it this way. It does begin in Bethlehem. And um, a famine grips the nation of Judah. And Naomi and Elimelech, her husband, should not have done it. It was against the law of God to leave Israel and go to a, an idol-worshiping country in which the Moabs, Moabites were. But they did that. Anytime you get out of the will of God, things don't go right. And I, want, I want that to sink in. If you're out of the will of God, you must get back in the will of God. Amen. And well, you better. they found themselves in Moab and Elimelech died, first of all. And then Naomi's two sons died as well, Shilion and Malon. She was left in this particular situation with two young ladies, the wives of her two sons. And so Orpha was the other one. And she says, I'm going back to my father. And I'm going back to the gods of Moab. This is a critical thing. You've got two girls there that had been married to two Israelites. Now that was not against the law of Moses, but it was if they continued to worship their idol gods. It was against the law. And Orpha said, I'm leaving. Here was an opportunity unparalleled. But she leaves. And Naomi turns to Ruth and said, you need to leave too. I have nothing I can give you, nothing. Naomi was wrong. She had everything to give her. Let me say that again. She had everything to give her. Let me tell you this. Don't you fuss and complain to the Lord if you have a job to where the others there don't know the Lord and they laugh at you and make fun of you and use foul language in front of you. Don't complain. Thank God that you have the opportunity to be a light in that darkness and to tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ and for them to have eternal life. Glory to God. When Francis and I first married, I had a job in, in the Northeast Soil Conservation District. I was an oil drag line. And and the, the, the boss, the superintendent, came out one day and said, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to cut everybody that works in this department. It was, I don't know how many machines. And we're going to cut you 25 cents an hour. And you say, well, that's not much. Well, in those days, it was worth about $3. And so it was a lot. But whenever the day came to where it was supposed to go into effect, we all gathered in the room, and and he told everybody you're going to be cut 25 cents an hour. The groans went up, and he said, "That's it." They left out. He said, "Jimmy, you stay. You stay." And I said, "What does he want? Is he going to fire me?" And everybody left, and there was nobody left but me and and the man that was the operator of the machine. He said, Jimmy, that does not go for you. We're not going to raise you 20, I mean, not going to cut you 25 cents an hour. We're going to raise you 25 cents an hour. And he said, he said, and I, I, I thought he didn't tell me this, but the operator did. Why did he not cut me as well? He said, uh, a lot of times you, we would have times to spare on that machine that didn't have anything to do. And I'd go out and pray. And if it was in the woods, I'd go out and seek the face of the Lord, whatever the case. 
And he said, many times I came out here, you didn't know I was here, he said, and I would hear you praying. And he thought, Lord, I can't cut that man 25 cents. Now, he's talking to God. Hallelujah. Well, glory. Well, glory. Well, glory. Praise the Lord. And he was right. I was talking to the Lord. Just a little talk with Jesus. Makes it right. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our troubles. Well, he'll hear our faintest cry, and he'll answer by and by. <laughs> now when you hear, feel a little prayer will turn in. You know a little fire is burning, and you find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Tell him all about our troubles. He'll hear your faintest cry. And he'll answer. Oh, bye bye. When you feel a little prayer wheel turning. And you know a little fire is burning. <laughs> you'll find a little talk with Jesus. Makes it right. Naomi said, I don't have anything to give you. She was wrong in that. She had everything to give her. She'd already given her eternal life, at least through the Lord. And said, You better go back to your family. And Ruth said, No, no. And her statement was, and where you live, that's where I will live. And you, wherever I lodge, you lodge, that's where I will lodge. Your God shall be my God. <laughs> Hallelujah. And what you have in your heart will be in my heart. And where you die or bury, that's where I will die and be buried. She, she made a consecration that very few make. And I, she says, I've got nothing to give you. Yes, you've given me much already. And so the, the Jewish Targums say that at about this time, an angel appeared to Naomi and said that there is bread now in Bethlehem. Bethlehem means the house of bread. The famine is over. There is bread in Bethlehem. Glory to God. I want there to be bread in this church. I want there to be bread in that choir. I want there to be bread in this pulpit. I want there to be bread to send it all over the world. That's what I want to see. To send it to Asia, to China, to send it to the islands of the sea, Central America, South America. Somebody said, why are you on television all over the world? Why not? Because we have a story to tell, a message to preach, a song to sing, life to give. Glory to God. The word of Almighty God. This program goes into over a hundred countries of the world. And thank God I can still say there is bread in Baton Rouge. Glory to God. There is bread in Baton Rouge. I said there is bread in Baton Rouge. Glory to God. And so they go back to Bethlehem. And Ruth leaves her family. She'll never see them again. She leaves her home. She leaves the area that she had been raised in all of her life. She leaves it never to see them again. Let me tell you, 
Jesus said, and of course he's right, mothers and fathers come second. Children come second. God comes first. God comes first. Understand that God comes first. They were destitute. They didn't have any welfare program in those days. Well, they did, but it was hard work. The reapers, when they were, and it was time of barley harvest, the reapers, when they uh, would reap the, the land for the grain, they were to leave portions a little bit on the ground for whoever was in need would pick it up and use it for food. That was their welfare program. And anyway, uh, Naomi told Ruth this, and Ruth said, I'm going to go and reap the field. And the scripture said, her happenstance was to light on the field of Boaz. Now, it was not really a happen chance. God, the Holy Spirit, led her there. <laughs> yes. I mean, right to the place. And, and Ruth had to be, the, the, the Targum says she was a beautiful lady, young lady. And, but in, in, in view of all of that, she was not lazy. She was willing to do some work. God can't use people that won't work. If you're lazy, just forget it, friend. You're probably too lazy to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> too lazy to even speak in tongues. <laughs> and so, Ruth, Ruth, she comes to this field. She doesn't know it's the field of Boaz. And Boaz is rich. I love the drama of this story. <laughs> Boaz, is, the scripture uses the term at least twice, very wealthy. And she goes to the field of, of Boaz and she reaps the grain. And takes him back and Naomi asks her, where did you go today? She said, I went to the field of Boaz. She said, oh, Lord, girl, he's as rich as Christus. <laughs> <laughs> the wheels were turning in her head. She said, tomorrow you go back to the field of Boaz. And make sure you get to where he sees you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And she said, well, who, who is Boaz? Never mind. Just go do what I tell you to do. For Naomi now is a type of the Holy Spirit. Boaz is a type of Christ. Praise God. And so she goes the next day and Boaz sees her. And he asks his reapers, who is that young maiden? <laughs> they said, well, that's the Moabites. Oh, that's Naomi's daughter-in-law. Yes, yes. Well, he said, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to leave some handfuls on purpose. I like that. Handfuls, it's, the scripture says, off purpose. Handfuls of purpose. And where she'll get more grain than she's ever had before. The other day in prayer, the Lord moved upon my heart concerning those of you who support this ministry. And, and uh, he said, you pray that everybody that supports it, that I will leave handfuls on purpose for them. <laughs> Glory to God. And he said, those who give sacrificially, pray that I will leave double handfuls on purpose for them. And I believe God has already begun to do that. To leave handfuls on purpose. To bless you. The Lord is a blesser. I believe in a God that, that, that meets our every need. I believe in a God that blesses. 
Lift men up on the shadows and plant your feet on higher ground. Glory to God. And he told the reapers, leave handfuls of purpose for her. And she carried more home that night than she had ever had before. And she said, you mean Boaz gave? Yes, she, he gave me all of this. He said, she said, now I'll tell you what I want you to do, young lady. Tomorrow when you go back to the field of Boaz, and don't you go anywhere else. You put on the prettiest dress that you've got. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and she's going to reap on the ground and she's going to wear a beautiful dress. <laughs> Hallelujah. And you see, he's the, he's the kinsman redeemer. He's the kin, kinsman redeemer of this family. And no doubt, she said, well, what is that? Well, she said, you just do what I tell you to do. Naomi's a type of the Holy Spirit. Just do what I tell you to do. And she did exactly that. But Naomi told her, you at night, when he's asleep, Lay down at his feet. You touch his feet. There's nothing untoward about this. Understand? That's, that was a custom in Israel of that day. And when he wakes up, you tell him that he's the kinsman redeemer. And he's to redeem the, what Naomi lost. Redeem it all. She did what Naomi told her to do. And he awakened, and he said, what are you doing here? She said, well, it's your business to redeem what Naomi has lost. You are next in line to redeem it. He said, you're right. He said, everybody knows you're a virtuous woman. And he said, I will redeem it if I can. But he said, there is one that is before me. He was called, oh, such a one that is before me. And he is a type of the law. And the law cannot redeem anything. As Lord capably preached this morning, the law cannot redeem anything. I want you to understand that. Can't redeem anything. And so anyway, she went home that that day and told Naomi what she had done. And Naomi said, well, this is going to turn out right. And I want you to do exactly what I tell you to do. Keep that pretty dress on and get some Chanel number five. <laughs> I'm telling you, isn't the gospel of Jesus Christ something beautiful? Praise God. And I mean, I'm, use some Chanel number no five. And wear that prettiest dress that you've got. And leave it up to him. Don't do anything else yourself. That's all that you'll do. And sit still. And the whole sentence really means sit still and see what he will do. What he will do. This is the great problem of the church. We, we talk about the world trying to get saved by doing works and whatever. We do the same identical thing by trying to sanctify ourselves. The world tries to justify itself and the church too often tries to sanctify itself. You can't. It's impossible. You cannot sanctify yourself. Now I want you to listen to this. Every person in this room and every person watching the television that's born again, that's saved of the blood of the Lamb, you are already sanctified. Come ahead. Paul said, you are washed, 
You are sanctified and you are justified. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. Justification is deliverance from the penalty of sin. While sanctification is deliverance from the power of sin. You can't deliver yourself. The church has ever tried to sanctify itself. You can't do it. Because you're already sanctified. And then the Holy Spirit, the moment you gave your heart to Christ, came into your heart, came into your life to do many things. But the greatest thing of all is to rid you of sin. For you to have victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil. And God cannot accept anything less than perfection. Understand that. Let me say it again. That doesn't mean I'm perfect or you're perfect. We aren't. But my position is in Christ. And Christ is perfect. Glory to God. Christ is perfect. I'm not perfect. You aren't perfect. But the Holy Spirit sets out to to perfect you in every way that he can be. Every one of you in this place, every one of you in the television, you look at yourself and there was a day and an hour that you were in bondage to something that was hindering and hurting you, but it's no longer there. It's gone. I said it's gone. It's gone. You couldn't get rid of it, but the Holy Spirit could, and the Holy Spirit did. Glory to God. And He's in your heart and in your life. And then you place your faith exclusively in Christ. And what Christ did for you at Calvary's cross. And the Holy Spirit sets out to get rid of that nicotine. Get rid of gossip. Get rid of jealousy. Get rid of envy. Get rid of malice. Get rid of alcohol. Oh, we've got now a lot of sipping saints. But the Holy Spirit wants to get rid of what you're sipping. (laughs) Glory Glory to God. And He can do it. You can't. You may, it may be anything that, that's given you victory that, that you, over whatever it might be. You may think you did it. No, you didn't. The Holy Spirit did it. He lives in your heart, lives in your life to rid you of all sin. That's what he desires to do. Sit still and see what the man will do. That's what Naomi tells Ruth. And I'm telling you, sit still and see what the Lord will do. Sit still and see what the Holy Ghost can do. Sit still. That means your works are not going to give you what you think. You cannot sanctify yourself. And I want to go again. You're already sanctified. Praise God. Well, I don't feel sanctified. You don't look it either. (laughs) But that doesn't matter. You are sanctified. Paul said, you're washed. Washed in the blood of the Lamb. You're washed. And you are sanctified. And you are justified. Not future tense, but now. And the way you get the Holy Spirit to work in your life, to get rid of the problems. And I know the other day I got, I said it today, well, as long as it was. I got a letter from a lady, and she read me the right act. I meant she laid into me. You did this, and you did that, and you didn't do that, and you didn't do this, and you did that. Then she laid in on her husband. 
She said, he's done this and done that, and he's not done this and not done that, and beside that, he drinks. I thought, lady, if I was married to you, I'd drink too. <laughs> demand a lot of you, but he does demand this, that your faith be in Christ and what Christ did for you at the cross. Amen. He demands that. And then he can work in your life and get rid of the problems. And I know most of you have been taught, well, I get sanctified when I go to the altars. No, read 1 Corinthians 6, 11 again. Paul said, and such were some of you. He gave a long list of sins that are evil. But he said, now you are no longer that person. You are washed. Washed in the blood of the Lamb. You are washed. You are sanctified. Not future tense, but now. You are justified. I see some of you walling your eyes at me. I can see it. <laughs> You think you can sanctify yourself. Well, I'm on a regimen right now. I'm doing this and so. Do it all you want to. You won't sanctify anything. You'll find your problem is still there. But when you, when you turn yourself over to the Holy Spirit and he starts to work within your life, uh, sit still and see what the man will do. Yeah. Glory to God. Sit still and see what the man will do. Glory to God. Glory to God. And the Holy Spirit will make of you what you need to be. You say, well, can I reach a place to where there's entire sanctification? I'll never fail again. No, there's too much wrong with you. <laughs> if you don't believe it, look in the mirror. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> no, there's no such thing as entire sanctification. It will be when the trump sounds. It will be when the trump sounds. But nowadays, you have a position in Christ, and that position is perfection. But your condition is not up to your position. And the Holy Spirit has to work on that condition to get you where. There's no way in the world that... that, that uh, Ruth could affect anything. She is poor. She has nothing. She cannot do anything, period, but do what Naomi told her to do. Sit still and see what the man will do. Glory to God is right. And, and that's what God wants you to do. You can't overcome that nicotine problem. You can fight it and fight it and fight it. You can't overcome it. You can't over overcome that gossip problem. Let him do it. You can't. Let him do it. But what's impossible for you is nothing for the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Glory to God. And, and he's in your heart and in your life. He sanctified you. Now he wants to bring you up. And he works on you to bring you up to where that you will inherit whatever. Now think about this. Ruth is going out every day, bending over and getting grain from the ground where it's been left by the reapers. That's all she has. That's all she has. But very soon, she's going to own the farm. Oh my God. <laughs> Hallelujah. She's going to own the whole thing. And not only that, she's going to have the privilege of being in the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Now, think of it. 